Ancient Alexandria, The History and Legacy of Egypt's Most Famous City by Charles River Editors Narrated by Colin Fluxman Introduction At the harbour of Alexandria stands the tower called Pharos, the first wonder. It is held together by glass and lead and is six hundred yards high. Epiphanius the monk Africa may have given rise to the first humans, and Egypt probably gave rise to the first great civilizations, which continue to fascinate modern societies across the globe nearly 5,000 years later. From the library and lighthouse of Alexandria to the great pyramid at Giza, the ancient Egyptians produced several wonders of the world, revolutionized architecture and construction, created some of the world's first systems of mathematics and medicine, and established language and art that spread across the known world. With world-famous leaders like King Tut and Cleopatra, it's no wonder that today's world has so many Egyptologists. The 5th century BCE Greek historian Herodotus wrote that Egypt was the gift of the Nile because the river made its soil so fertile and thus helped create one of the first great civilizations. Indeed, the land of Egypt so impressed the Greeks that when Alexander the Great conquered the Nile Valley in the 4th century BCE, he decided that he would build a new city on its soil and name it Alexandria. After Alexander, the city of Alexandria grew and became the most important city in the world for centuries, as it watched and played a role in the rise and fall of numerous dynasties. The city also became home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Lighthouse of Alexandria and a center of culture and learning, which was exemplified by the Library of Alexandria. Truly, Alexandria was as unique as it was great. It was a Greek city built on Egyptian soil that was later ruled by the Romans and then became an important center of early Christian culture. Today, Alexandria is a teeming metropolis that, although much larger than it was in ancient times, is a shadow of its former self, culturally speaking. So what made Alexandria stand apart from other ancient cities, such as Rome and Babylon, and how did it become the gift of the Mediterranean? The answer is complicated, but an examination of Alexandria's history reveals that from the time the city was founded until the Arab conquest, the different dynasties who ruled there took the time and effort to foster and patronize arts, culture, and learning that made Alexandria famous. Alexandria was also an important center of trade in the ancient Mediterranean world, as tons of grain, gold, and papyri sailed down the Nile River on barges to the harbors in Alexandria, and then to the rest of the world, while exotic spices, silks, and other commodities were imported into Egypt via the same harbors in the ancient city. Some of the features of Alexandria changed throughout the centuries, but its most vital components remained consistent. Alexandria meant different things to different people, but for over 500 years, all people saw the city as a center of culture. Ancient Alexandria, the history and legacy of Egypt's most famous city, examines the history of one of the ancient world's most important cities. Chapter 1. The Foundation and Orientation of Alexandria Ever since the famous Persian invasions that had been repelled by the Athenians at Marathon and then by the Spartans at Thermopylae and Plataea, Greece and Persia had been at odds. For the past few years they had enjoyed an uneasy peace, but that peace was shattered when in 334 BCE Alexander crossed the Hellespont into Persia. He brought with him an army of 50,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and a navy of over 100 ships a mixed force of Macedonians, Greeks, Thracians, and Illyrians, all chosen for their specific strengths. The Thessalians, for example, were famous cavalrymen. This mongrel force would become Alexander's modus operandi for the remainder of his campaigns. Alexander's invasion was immediately challenged. At the Granicus in modern Turkey, Alexander crushed a force of 30,000 Persian troops sent to oppose him, and during the battle he led the cavalry himself, as he was accustomed to doing. The destruction of this Persian field army granted him control of virtually all the neighboring territory, and he captured the city of Sardis before marching on the fortress of Halicarnassus, which fell after a vicious siege. From there he proceeded to Lycia and Pamphylia, systematically conquering all the coastal territory of Asia Minor. He then marched inland, where he famously visited the city of Gordium, seat of a renowned temple, 
The temple housed a cart whose parts were held together by a supposedly unsolvable knot, and legend had it that any man who could untie it would be made king of Asia. Alexander, disdaining any attempt at trying to fumble at the knot with his fingers, simply drew his sword and hacked it in two. After wintering in Asia Minor, Alexander crossed into the Persian heartland in 333 BCE. Finally moved to action by what he at least perceived as a serious threat, the Persian emperor Darius III mustered an army that most sources suggest numbered almost 100,000 men and marched against Alexander. Battle was joined at Issus in November of 333 BCE. The battle was vicious, and Alexander lost more than 7,000 men, but he annihilated the Persian army, inflicting more than 20,000 casualties upon them and forcing them to flee the field. Darius escaped in the rout, but Alexander's men captured his royal treasury, his wife, daughters, and mother. Alexander disdainfully refused an offer from Darius of a peace treaty and land concessions, claiming that as he was now king of Asia, it fell to him to decide how to dispose of his possessions. Alexander then marched into Syria, which he conquered with relative ease, but his attempts at pacifying the region in short order were frustrated, first by the city of Tyre, and then again by the stronghold of Gaza. Both cities had colossal fortifications that required the construction of siege works and engines of war on a scale hitherto unseen to reduce, and the resistance from both garrisons was exceedingly fierce, prompting Alexander to kill all men of fighting age and sell survivors into slavery when they were finally taken. At Gaza, as Alexander personally led an attack against the walls, he was struck by a missile from above and seriously injured in the shoulder, one of the many serious wounds he was to accrue in his time as a fighting king. Having witnessed the fate of Tyre and Gaza, the garrison of Jerusalem capitulated to Alexander without a fight, allowing him to push southwards into Egypt. The ancient kingdom of the pharaohs had been reduced to a vassal state of Persia, and its inhabitants greeted Alexander like a liberator, the entire country falling to him without a fight. In 332 BCE, Alexander made a pilgrimage to the shrine of Siwa in the Egyptian desert, where the oracle proclaimed him ruler of the world and son of Amon, the Egyptian patriarchal deity, leading Alexander to adopt the title son of Zeus Amon. Coins minted by him from there on out showed him with ram's horns as a mark of his divine parentage. It is unclear whether Alexander truly believed the rumors of his own divinity, but it is undeniable that the oracle's verdict severely inflated his pride, prompting the first accusations of hubris from his supporters, some of whom also grumbled that Alexander was getting dangerously close to going native. Alexander, who was not fazed by these murmurings, journeyed to northern Egypt, where he founded Alexandria in Egypt, his most famous city. After letting his soldiers recuperate and receiving reinforcements, in 331 BCE he struck eastwards and marched into Mesopotamia, the Persian heartland. One major difference between Alexandria and the other notable ancient cities was that Alexandria was planned from its inception on a limited space. Alexandria was conceived as a physical manifestation of the Greek idea of Hellenism, which can best be described as the promotion of Greek culture throughout the world. The Greek language was taught to the elites of the peoples Alexander conquered, and more mundane Greek pleasures, such as olive growing and other foods native to Greece, were imported to the conquered lands. The most immediate way that Alexander and his men promoted Hellenism was by building a number of cities named Alexandria. These cities varied in size, but they were all strongly Greek in character, despite not being on Greek soil. Of course, the Alexandria that would become the largest in size and the most culturally influential was the one built in Egypt. As Alexander led his men through Lower Egypt, they arrived on the Mediterranean coast at the site of a pharaonic village named Rakhedet. The site of Rakhedet proved to be optimal, so Alexander decreed the site to be the future Alexandria in 331 BCE. Once Alexander approved the site, his workers wasted no time building the city. It is unknown precisely how long it took to build Alexandria, but more than one historical source relates the details. Arian's account is one of an ebullient Alexander falling in love with the site. From Heliopolis he crossed the river to Memphis, where, among the other gods, he offered a special sacrifice to Apis, 
and held games with both athletic and literary contests. He proceeded around Lake Mariotis and finally came ashore at the spot where Alexandria, the city which bears his name, now stands. He was at once struck by the excellence of the site and convinced that if a city were built upon it, it would prosper. Such was his enthusiasm that he could not wait to begin the work. He himself designed the general layout of the new town, indicating the position of the market square, the number of temples to be built, and what gods they should serve, the gods of Greece and the Egyptian Isis, and the precise limits of its outer defences. He offered sacrifice for a blessing on the work, and the sacrifice proved favourable. The first century BCE Greek historian Diodorus provided slightly more details regarding the choice of the site by pointing out the location of its harbour. He decided to found a great city in Egypt and gave orders to the men left behind with his mission to build the city between the marsh and the sea. He laid out the site and traced the streets skillfully and ordered that the city should be called after him, Alexandria. It was conveniently situated near the harbour of Pharos, and by selecting the right angle of the streets, Alexander made the city breathe with the Etesian winds, so that as these blow across a great expanse of sea, they cool the air of the town, and so he provided its inhabitants with a moderate climate and good health. Alexander also laid out the walls, so that they were at once exceedingly large and marvellously strong. Both accounts are similar in that the city's namesake, Alexander, is credited with the design, but that honour probably went to a man named Doncrates of Rhodes. Either way, the design of Alexandria is truly something that made it unique among other cities of the ancient world. For one thing, Alexandria was a design city that did not allow for unplanned growth. It was planned in the shape of a clamus, a Macedonian-style cape, with streets that followed a specific grid pattern. Modern Alexandria would be scarcely recognisable to one of its original inhabitants, as the modern city has been allowed to grow in both girth and population. Despite the original limitations placed on Alexandria, the city grew to a certain extent in ancient times. Diodorus wrote, Alexander gave orders to build a palace notable for its size and massiveness. And not only Alexander, but those who after him ruled Egypt, down to our own time, with few exceptions, have enlarged this with lavish additions. The city in general has grown so much in later times that many reckon it to be the first city of the civilized world, and it is certainly far ahead of all the rest in elegance and extent and riches and luxury. The number of its inhabitants surpasses that of those in other cities. At the time when we were in Egypt, those who kept the census returns of the population said that its free residents were more than 300,000, and that the king received from the revenues of the country more than 6,000 talents. The 1st century BCE Greek geographer Strabo corroborated Diodorus's account, but he also added details about the alignment and composition of the streets. The city as a whole is intersected by streets practicable for horse-riding and chariot-driving, and by two that are very broad, extending to more than a plethrum in breadth which cut one another into two sections and at right angles. And the city contains most beautiful public precincts, and also the royal palaces, which constitute one-fourth or even one-third of the whole circuit of the city. For just as each of the kings, from love of splendour, was wont to add some adornment to the public monuments, so also he would invest himself at his own expense with a residence in addition to those already built. One of the more interesting aspects of Alexandria's physical composition, and one that set it apart from other ancient cities, was its division into ethnic neighbourhoods or quarters. For instance, the Delta and Beta quarters were Jewish, while the native Egyptians lived in and around Rakhedet, and the Greeks had the rest of the city. Alexandria was first and foremost a Greek city, but from its inception it was also multicultural, which at times would be a source of problems. Strabo wrote about the Greeks, Egyptians, and a mercenary class that all lived in Alexandria. At any rate, Polybius, who has visited the city, is disgusted with the state of things then existing, and he says that three classes inhabited the city. First, the Egyptian or native stock of people who were quick-tempered and not inclined to civic life, and secondly, the mercenary class, who were severe and numerous and intractable. 
for by an ancient custom they would maintain foreign men-at-arms who had been trained to rule rather than to be ruled on account of the worthlessness of the kings. And third, the tribe of Alexandrians, who also were not distinctly inclined to civil life, and for the same reasons, but still they were better than those others, for even though they were a mixed people, still they were Greeks by origin, and mindful of the customs common to the Greeks. A couple of notable details are apparent in Strabo's description of the ethnic composition of Alexandria. First, there is no mention of the Jews, who were a significant part of the population. Perhaps the anti-Jewish attitude of the Romans during his life influenced the geographer to omit them, although he could have written about them in less than glowing terms, as he did with the others. Second, the Greek Alexandrians were viewed in a less than favorable manner, which suggests the Romans who Strabo worked for viewed the Alexandrian Greeks as less Greek than their mainland cousins. Third, the mention of mercenaries is interesting and somewhat accurate. The Egyptians began importing mercenaries to fight in their armies in the 7th century BCE, many of whom were Greek, so the existence of these people in Alexandria during Strabo's life is not surprising. Chapter 2 The Library of Alexandria Soon after Alexandria was built, its rulers, who were as unique as the city, pursued a policy of making it the greatest city in the world. Alexander's death in 323 BCE set his newly acquired empire into temporary chaos due to succession issues, but the problems were rectified when his generals decided to amicably divide the empire amongst themselves into thirds. Egypt was taken by Alexander's most capable general, Ptolemy, son of Lagos, who saw in Egypt great culture, wealth, and potential. Ptolemy also had the benefit of following on Alexander's heels by being accepted among the Egyptians as their legitimate pharaoh once the oracle of Siwa proclaimed him as much. After Ptolemy took control, he wasted no time consolidating his power and establishing a Greek dynasty to rule over Egypt from the new capital of Alexandria in 305-304 BCE. Ptolemy I then erected many monuments and buildings throughout the city which included the ostentatious royal palace. One of the more important buildings that Ptolemy I had built was the royal necropolis that was connected to the palace, which held the body of Alexander the Great. Strabo wrote, The Sema also, as it is called, is a part of the royal palaces. This was the enclosure that contained the burial places of the kings and that of Alexander. For Ptolemy, the son of Lagos, forestalled Perdiccas by taking the body away from him when he was bringing it down from Babylon, and was turning aside toward Egypt, moved by greed and a desire to make that country his own. And the body of Alexander was carried off by Ptolemy and given sepulture in Alexandria, where it still now lies, not, however, in the same sarcophagus as before, for the present one is made of glass, whereas the one wherein Ptolemy laid, it was made of gold. This passage demonstrates both Ptolemy I's political acumen and the importance of Alexandria. Ptolemy I knew that he had to legitimize his new dynasty, so he brought the body of Alexander from Babylon to Alexandria in order to demonstrate his connection with the deceased conqueror in the new city. Ptolemy I established his dynasty on firm ground, both literally and figuratively, but it was his successor, Ptolemy II, who truly made Alexandria the cultural epicenter of the ancient world. Ptolemy II, who ruled from 285 to 246 BCE, set out to continue his predecessor's ambitious plan to bring Alexandria to peaks of greatness by having the Library of Alexandria built, among other things. The library served as a repository of all accumulated knowledge from throughout the Hellenic world, and Ptolemy II also patronized scholars by funding their academic activities in the library and throughout Alexandria. Since no archaeological remains of the Library of Alexandria exist, or at least none have been positively identified, determining its physical properties is difficult and relies upon scant primary sources. The library was probably part of the royal palace and an annex to what was known as the museum. The museum was not a museum in the modern sense of the word, but a community of academic and religious scholars who gathered in the Shrine of the Muses, the Greek deities of the arts and intellect, to do their work. 
It is impossible to definitively say if the museum and library were two separate buildings, but modern scholars believe that the library was part of the larger museum complex. The only first-hand description of the museum and library comes from the Greek historian geographer Strabo, circa 64 BC to 24 AD, who visited Alexandria in 24 BC and then lived in Egypt for a time. Strabo wrote, The museum is also a part of the royal palaces. It has a public walk, an excedra with seats, and a large house in which is the common mess hall of the men of learning who share the museum. This group of men not only hold property in common, but also have a priest in charge of the museum, who formerly was appointed by the kings, but is now appointed by Caesar. Unfortunately, the nearest text to a complete history of the Library of Alexandria that could complement Strabo's description comes from the 12th century AD writings of the Byzantine scholar John Tsetses, which are actually based on older, no longer extant texts. Furthermore, many modern scholars have questioned the accuracy of his writings. Although the precise location of the Library of Alexandria may remain a mystery, its librarians and the contents of the collection are better known, and certainly more important. After all, while the establishment and patronage of the Library of Alexandria made the institution a possibility, the diligence and hard work of its early librarians made it legendary. Indeed, the first librarians of the Library of Alexandria were true scholarly pioneers, because they lived in a period long before the standards of academic research were as established as they are today. For example, there was no Dewey Decimal Classification System, and no collection as large as the Library of Alexandria had ever existed. Since the Library of Alexandria was part of the larger museum, and the museum was part of the Royal Palace Complex, Scholars believe that the position of librarian was appointed by the king. It's important to remember that the duties of the librarian went beyond just a mere reshelving of books and maintenance of the collection. In fact, the librarians often edited classic works of literature, some of which provided the basis for the editions often read today. Scholars even know some of the names of the most famous librarians. Instrumental in establishing the first books in the collection was a man named Demetrius of Phalerum. Although Demetrius was a pupil of the Aristotelian Academy in Athens, in his early life he was a warrior and statesman. Demetrius saw little success as a military commander, but he was able to usurp the government in Athens and become its tyrant for ten years. However, since Athens was a city with a long history of democracy, his rule was not popular, and he was expelled in 307 BC. Because Demetrius was an exile, he had limited options concerning where to live. But since the new Ptolemy dynasty in Alexandria was interested in making their city a cultural and scholarly center, Demetrius, due to his connection to the Aristotelian school, was invited to settle in Egypt. Demetrius eventually settled in Alexandria, where he began to collect books for the new Library of Alexandria and 1st century A.D. Jewish historian Josephus wrote, Demetrius Phalerius, who was library keeper to the king, was now endeavoring, if it were possible, to gather together all the books that were in the habitable earth, and buying whatsoever was anywhere valuable or agreeable to the king's inclination. Demetrius's efforts to make the Library of Alexandria were later followed by at least two other librarians, notable for their scholarship and innovations. Xenodotus of Ephesus, circa 285 to 270 BC, proved to be quite a capable librarian, as he was the first to organize all the entries into alphabetical order. This may seem like a small feat today, but given that there was no system of library organization before him, his efforts must be viewed from a proper perspective. Furthermore, what set Xenodotus apart from others and made him a great scholar of the museum and the library of Alexandria was his edition of Homer's classics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Today, new editions of classic books are common, and there are often different translations and editions of the same work available through different publishers, a trend that can be traced back to Xenodotus and his work at the library of Alexandria. Homer's classics were considered to be the pinnacle of literature by the ancient Greeks, so any revision was a serious matter. One major revision Xenodotus made was the deletion of line 88 from Book 4 of the Iliad, which stated the goddess Athena was the godlike Pandarus, wherever he might be. 
Xenodotus argued that it would be impossible to depict a goddess searching for the object of her quest. His editing of Homer's classics represents not only some of the earliest recorded such acts, but also an early example of the scholarly process of inquiry that took place in the Library of Alexandria. Xenodotus was succeeded by Callimachus of Cyrene as librarian of the Library of Alexandria. Callimachus is mentioned by Strabo because he was held in honour by the Egyptian kings. The Egyptian Ptolemy kings no doubt honoured Callimachus not only for his erudite knowledge, but also for his supreme organisational skills that surpassed even those of his illustrious predecessor. Besides being the librarian of the Library of Alexandria, Callimachus is known for essentially inventing the world's first card catalogue. Callimachus wrote a multi-volume work known today as The Tables, which was a 120-book bibliographical survey of all known Greek writers. The tables were divided into categories that included the following, epics, tragedies, comedies, history, medicine, rhetoric and law, and miscellaneous works. In terms of library order and book classification, Callimachus's tables was a good start, but the system was still prone to confusion. There were several books with the same title, and even more confusing was the fact that several different authors had the same name, a problem compounded by the fact that most ancient Greeks did not have surnames. Another significant librarian of the Library of Alexandria was a man named Eratosthenes, who worked there from 245 to 205 BC. Strabo also mentions Eratosthenes as being an honored scholar by the Ptolemaic kings, Aristophanes' work focused on expanding the size of the globe. Educated Greeks knew the world was round to include lands encountered by the Greeks during Alexander the Great's expedition. The librarians made the Library of Alexandria function as an institution of learning like none other before it, but their work was made most important by the books that were stored within it. This was especially true of the Library of Alexandria because it housed most of the written knowledge that had been accumulated in the ancient Mediterranean world, something made all the more remarkable by the fact that there was no real precedent for stocking a library of such size and quality. Over the centuries, the Ptolemies used their great power as rulers of Egypt to stock the Library of Alexandria through a variety of different tactics. For example, they used their wealth to send agents throughout the Greek-speaking world to buy books, while any ship that docked in the harbour of Alexandria had whatever books it had on board confiscated and copied, with the copies returned to the owners and the originals kept in the library. All told, it is believed that over 500,000 papyrus book scrolls were stored inside the library, while another 42,000 were housed in a library attached to the nearby Temple of Serapis. Referring to the size of the collection, Josephus wrote, and when once Ptolemy asked him how many ten thousand of books he had collected, he replied that he had already about twenty times ten thousand, but that in a little time he should have fifty times ten thousand. The number of books stated by Josephus would have made the library of Alexandria's collection not only the largest of its time, but also the largest for several centuries later. Historian Roger Bagnall argues that the numbers given by Josephus may be exaggerated, but even still he believes that the Library of Alexandria was still the largest of the ancient world and for several centuries thereafter. Either way, it's clear that when it came to the collection of the Library of Alexandria, the Ptolemies believed that size did matter. To Egypt's rulers, the Library of Alexandria represented a point of prestige that set them above the rest of the Greek world, and the rest of the world for that matter, and the books within it were a sort of currency. In essence, the more they possessed, the more valuable the library was, and, by extension, the more powerful the Ptolemies were as well. It was not just the size of the Library of Alexandria's collection that made it so important. Over time, it came to contain some of the most important literary works of the ancient world. At the heart of the library's collection were the works of the Greek writers, which included all genres and styles. The library housed copies of Homer, Euripides, Sophocles, and the father of history himself, Herodotus, just to name a few. The library was also home to a wide range of different genres of Greek literature, from the more mundane to the esoteric, the topic did not matter to the Ptolemies, who were anxious to stock the shelves of the library with anything written in Greek. The glories of all aspects of Greek literary culture were on display in the Library of Alexandria. 
and it was clear that the Ptolemies were responsible for the showing. But perhaps more interesting than the classics of Greek literature were the non-Greek texts stored in the library. Although the Greeks were an inquisitive and eclectic people when it came to art, literature, and science, they were also stubborn when it came to learning other people's languages. The ancient Greeks rarely learned any language other than their own, and even the Ptolemies, with the exception of Cleopatra the Seventh, never learned the language of the native Egyptians. However, despite the Greek obstinacy towards foreign languages, the Library of Alexandria contained thousands of Greek translations of Babylonian, Phoenician, Egyptian, and Hebrew texts and monuments. Probably the most famous Near Eastern text that was translated into Greek and stored in the Library of Alexandria was the Old Testament, which was known by the Greeks as the Septuagint, 70, for the 70 books it contains. Other notable Near Eastern texts that were translated into Greek included verses attributed to the Persian prophet Zoroaster, Egyptian king lists, and Jewish law. If the Greeks never bothered to learn foreign languages, how did they translate Near Eastern texts? The answer can be found in the same concept that gave birth to the Library of Alexandria itself, Hellenism. Hellenism, the universal idea that encouraged non-Greeks under Greek rule to embrace and emulate Greek language and culture, spread through the native populations of the ancient Near East. At the same time, Hellenism never discouraged non-Greeks under Greek rule to abandon their native traditions, which meant that a form of cultural syncretism developed in some of the older and more sophisticated cultures the Greeks ruled. In other words, Jews, Mesopotamians, Egyptians, and Persians from the upper classes of their societies continued to practice religion as their ancestors did, but they learned the Greek language in order to maintain their privileged position in the new Hellenized society. These men were mainly priests, as priests were the most educated men in ancient Near Eastern societies, and they subsequently translated their religious texts and histories into Greek, which were then housed in the Library of Alexandria. Unfortunately, the identities of most of these men is unknown to modern scholars, but the identity of one is known, and that provides a glimpse into how this process took place, and how the ancient Near Eastern literary traditions, especially the Egyptian tradition, influenced the Library of Alexandria. Maneto was a high priest of Ra from the Egyptian delta city of Sebenetos, who lived during the reign of the first three Ptolemy kings, when the Library of Alexandria was flourishing. He is best known for his history of Egypt, the epitome, which only exists today in fragments, but he was active in the cultural affairs of both the Egyptians and Greeks. For instance, he is attributed as one of the founders of the syncretic Egyptian-Greek cult of Serapis, and the Temple of Serapis also contained a library during the life of the Library of Alexandria. A letter attributed to Manetto and addressed to King Ptolemy II details the academic and intellectual work the priest conducted on behalf of the Greek king. Greeting to my lord Ptolemy from Manetto, high priest and scribe of the sacred shrines of Egypt, born at Sabenitus and dwelling at Heliopolis. It is my duty, almighty king, to reflect upon all such matters as you may desire me to investigate. So, as you are making researches concerning the future of the universe, in obedience to your command, I shall place before you the sacred books which I have studied. Of all the work that Manetto did for the Ptolemies, the most enduring was his History of Egypt, which was written in Greek, but followed a template that was a combination of the prototypical Egyptian king list and annals. Ancient Egyptian king lists were simply listings of kings' names in the hieroglyphic script, which were usually inscribed into the walls of temples. But king lists were not always accurate, because some kings were considered anathema to Egyptian culture. For example, the name of the 18th dynasty monotheist king, Akhenaten, was often absent from lists. Meanwhile, Egyptian annals were inscriptions that contained brief information about a king's reign, such as a significant event like a battle, the kind of thing modern people think of as history. Like the Library of Alexandria itself, Manetto's History of Egypt represented the convergence of both the Egyptian and Greek literary traditions. It is unknown if Manetto worked in the Library of Alexandria himself, but his History of Egypt was undoubtedly stored there, as well as other works attributed to him. Manetto was just one of many native Egyptians who translated his people's history and religion into Greek.
One often overlooked aspect of the library's collection is that while it boasted of 500,000 books, not all of them were authentic. The ambition of the Ptolemies to make the Library of Alexandria the greatest such institution in the world and the ability to pay hefty prices for rare books led to the creation of an industry of ancient professional forgers and plagiarists. In the Library of Alexandria's early years, the competition with the Library of Pergamum also contributed to forgeries and fakes being produced and circulated in both libraries. Without such modern conventions as copyright and trademark laws, forgeries began to inundate the ancient book market. For example, modern scholars point to the large number of dubious works attributed to Plato and refer to the authors of these works as pseudo-Plato. Likewise, dubious works attributed to Moneto are credited to pseudo-Moneto. The number of forgeries approached such a high level that a genre of literature actually developed to extol the economic benefits of such endeavors. Although the number of forgeries housed in the Library of Alexandria may have been high, scholars and librarians would argue that one is too many, they were not the reason for the library's ultimate and controversial demise. The Library of Alexandria was clearly an important institution in the ancient Mediterranean world, and its collection of books was the largest and most influential of the ancient world. In fact, modern research methods and library cataloging can be traced to its halls. All of this begs the question of how such an important institution vanished. Ironically, the destruction of the Library of Alexandria is one of the most talked-about aspects, and the one thing that people often think that they know about, yet the answer to this question is shrouded in mystery and the subject of legendary stories that only serve to make the history of the library more clouded and mysterious. Throughout the last millennium, numerous stories have circulated that ascribe blame for the destruction of the Library of Alexandria to different sources, and among these, the three most prominent theories involve foreign conquests. The destruction of the library has been attributed to Roman General Julius Caesar's men burning it during the civil wars in 48 or 47 BC. Roman Emperor Theodosius, having the Serapium and possibly the main library of Alexandria, burned around 390 AD, or even the Muslim Caliph Omar ordering the library burned when he conquered Egypt in 642 AD. The first and most prominent theory is that when Julius Caesar sided with Cleopatra VII in her bid for the throne of Egypt against her brother Ptolemy XIII, a fire inadvertently destroyed the Library of Alexandria during the fighting. This theory was most notably put forth by Plutarch, who wrote in his Life of Caesar that when the enemy endeavoured to cut off his communication by sea, Caesar was forced to divert that danger by setting fire to his own ships, which, after burning the docks, then spread on and destroyed the great library. This theory was later advocated by writers such as the Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca, who wrote in 65 AD that 40,000 books were burned, and it was mostly popularized in the 18th century by historian Edward Gibbon. Some Roman writers even claimed that Mark Antony had scrolls removed from the Library of Pergamum and brought to Alexandria as a replacement for Cleopatra, but this is believed to be propaganda by supporters of Octavian who were trying to paint Antony in a bad light ahead of their own civil war. The civil war certainly brought much turmoil to areas of the Mediterranean world, especially in Egypt, but other Roman historical sources appear to contradict the idea that the Library of Alexandria was one of its victims. The first century AD Roman historian Suetonius wrote in the Twelve Caesars about the Library of Alexandria during the reign of the Emperor Claudius, who ruled from 41 to 54 AD. To conclude, he even wrote books in Greek. 20 volumes of Etruscan history and 8 of Carthaginian. The city of Alexandria acknowledged these works by adding a new wing to the museum called the Claudian in his honor, and by having the Etruscan history publicly recited from end to end once a year by relays of reader in the old wing and the Carthaginian history, likewise in the new. If Suetonius's account is accurate, then it is difficult to believe that the Library of Alexandria was destroyed during the civil wars in the second half of the first century BC, only to be rebuilt less than 100 years later in time for Claudius to have a wing named in his honor. Such a feat would be next to impossible, considering the limited construction technology of the time. 
Furthermore, Strabo made no mention of a fire or any destruction when he wrote about the museum while in Alexandria in 24 BC. The available primary sources seem to contradict the theory that the Library of Alexandria was destroyed during the Civil Wars. This led modern historian Theodore Vretos to try to square the different accounts. The Roman galleys carrying the 37th legion from Asia Minor had now reached the Egyptian coast, but because of contrary winds, they were unable to proceed toward Alexandria. At anchor in the harbour off Locius, the Egyptian fleet posed an additional problem for the Roman ships. However, in a surprise attack, Caesar's soldiers set fire to the Egyptian ships, resulting in the flames spreading rapidly and consuming most of the dockyard, including many structures near the palace. This fire resulted in the burning of several thousand books that were housed in one of the buildings. From this incident, historians mistakenly assume that the great library of Alexandria had been destroyed, but the library was nowhere near the docks. The most immediate damage occurred in the area around the docks in shipyards, arsenals, and warehouses in which grains and books were stored. Some 40,000 book scrolls were destroyed in the fire. Not at all connected with the great library, they were account books and ledgers containing records of Alexandria's export goods bound for Rome and other cities throughout the world. If Caesar's men didn't burn the library, what actually happened? Scholars are left to consider if the library of Alexandria was destroyed during the reign of one of the later Roman emperors, such as Theodosius or Aurelian, or during the Muslim conquest of Egypt. It's possible that the library's destruction was much more benign and much less intentional. After all, fire is not the only possible explanation for the library's destruction, considering the medium that most of the books were written on and the changing geopolitics of the ancient world during the beginning of the first century AD. Most books housed in the Library of Alexandria were written on the reed papyrus, and although susceptible to fire, papyrus is also at the mercy of other elements, such as humidity. While some scholars believe the library actually took measures to deal with the effects of humidity via the actual architecture of the building, Bagnall argues that the humid climate of Alexandria, as opposed to the drier Saharan climate across the rest of Egypt, would have ensured the destruction of any books written on papyrus. The destruction would have taken place over hundreds of years and would not have been as dramatic as a fire, but the loss would have been just as thorough. Chapter 3. The Lighthouse of Alexandria While Alexandria is still remembered as a cultural hub, thanks to the library, among other things, the city's economic activities were just as important to its place in history. From the time Alexandria was founded until the Islamic conquest of Egypt in 642 CE, Alexandria was unquestionably the most important commercial city in the Mediterranean region. Unlike many Greeks who favoured war to attain and increase their power, the Ptolemies preferred business and realized Egypt's economic potential, which they exploited shortly after they came to power, by restructuring the Egyptian government. The governmental reforms of the Ptolemies included the reorganization of agricultural and craft production in order to maximize tax potential, and the Ptolemies also introduced banking to Egypt, all of which was spurred by the export of Egypt's two most prized commodities, grain and papyrus. Alexandria proved to be the perfect place to facilitate trade in and out of Egypt, since it was home to two natural harbours that were separated by a man-made dike known as the Hepter Stadium. The dike connected the mainland with the island known as the Pharos, for which the Lighthouse of Alexandria would be named. On the south end of Alexandria, on Lake Mariotis, was another harbour that linked river-going vessels through a system of canals to the canopic branch of the Nile River, and ultimately to the main body of the Nile River. From there, river ships would sail to the important upper Egyptian river port of Coptos, and then through overland routes to the Red Sea and beyond. The Romans later built roads that connected Alexandria directly to the Nile River, and therefore connected Rome with the world after the Roman conquest of Egypt. In essence, all of the trade that flowed in and out of Egypt during the Ptolemaic and Roman periods was facilitated largely by the existence of the lighthouse. Although it was an unimportant place before Alexandria, the Greeks knew enough about the Pharos island that it entered their literary tradition through the works of Homer centuries before Alexandria was built. According to the Odyssey, 
There is an island called Pharos in the rolling seas off the mouth of the Nile, a day sailing for a ship with a roaring wind astern. In this island is a sheltered cove where sailors put in to draw their water from a well and afterwards launch their trim ships into the deep sea. It was there that the dogs kept me for twenty days, and all that time there was never a sign of the offshore breezes that speed ships out and into the open sea. Exactly when the Pharos lighthouse was built cannot be definitively determined without more primary sources to corroborate a date, but the lighthouse was probably begun, or at least envisioned, during the reign of Ptolemy I, 323 to 282 BC, in the 290s, and it is believed to have been finished during the reign of his successor, Ptolemy II, 284 to 246. It is also unknown to modern scholars why the Ptolemies decided to actually build the lighthouse. Although the practical application of the Pharos lighthouse facilitated maritime trade and travel to and from Egypt, there were no lighthouses before the Pharos, and it is not known who suggested the concept to the Ptolemies, assuming the rulers didn't think of the idea themselves. It is also unclear from where the subsequent shape and architecture for the lighthouse were derived. Ptolemy I may have been inspired by the great monuments he observed in Mesopotamia and especially Egypt, so he may have wanted to construct his own. Ptolemy would undoubtedly have seen the great Pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, up the Nile River near Memphis, which at that time would still have been a site with its glistening white limestone encasing still intact. It should also be noted that the Library of Alexandria was also built during the reign of one of the first two Ptolemies. There are also no extant documents that record either Ptolemy's commission of the Library of Alexandria but since both the library and the Pharos lighthouse were built around the same time, there may have been a larger building program that included both, and perhaps others now lost, to be built at the same time. Such an ambitious building project would have recalled the memory of Khufu, who had thousands of laborers work on his pyramid over the course of a generation. It appears that when the lighthouse and probably the library were completed, a great festival was held in Alexandria in 279 B.C., to honor the king and his new monuments. The completion of the Pharos lighthouse would have been a momentous occasion, as its size was truly monumental, and the price to complete the work was just as grand. According to the ancient writer Pliny, it cost 800 talents of silver to build the lighthouse, which by today's standards would amount to approximately $50 million. Said to have been constructed mostly out of limestone, the lighthouse would have definitely had a bright white exterior during days lit by the sun, possibly reminding natives of the Great Pyramid of Giza's similar limestone exterior. Although the origins of the Pharos lighthouse remain murky due to a dearth of primary sources, there are many extant sources that depict and describe the monument throughout the centuries. Although no single primary source gives a complete description of the Pharos lighthouse, the ones that do exist can be collated and corroborated to get a fairly accurate assessment of the monument's physical features. The most complete description of the Pharos lighthouse was written by the 1st century BC historian and geographer Strabo, who visited Alexandria and viewed the Pharos island at a time when the lighthouse was already over 200 years old. Strabo described the entire Alexandria harbour. And, likewise, the extremity of the isle is a rock, which is washed all round by the sea, and has upon it a tower that is admirably constructed of white marble with many stories, and bears the same name as the island. This was an offering made by Sostratus of Nidus, a friend of the king's, for the safety of mariners, as the inscription says, for since the coast was harbourless and low on either side, and also had reefs and shallows, those who were sailing from the open sea thither needed some lofty and conspicuous sign to enable them to direct their course aright to the entrance of the harbour, and the western mouth is also not easy to enter, although it does not require so much caution as the other, and it likewise forms a second harbour, that of Eunostus, as it is called, which was dug by the hand of man. For the harbour which affords the entrance on the side of the above-mentioned tower of Pharos is the great harbour, whereas these two lie continuous with that harbour in their innermost recess, being separated from it only by the embankment called the Hepta Stadium. The embankment forms a bridge extending from the mainland to the western portion of the island, 
and leaves open only two passages into the harbour of Eunostus, which are bridged over. However, this work formed not only a bridge to the island, but also an aqueduct, at least when Pharos was inhabited. But in these present times it has been laid waste by the deified Caesar in his war against the Alexandrians, since it had sided with the kings. One of the most historically useful facts from Strabo's detailed description of the Pharos lighthouse is the mention of its possible architect, Sostratus of Nidus. Most scholars believe that the inscription was somewhere near the top of the lighthouse, which would have placed it in a place of pride on the monument. What little is known of Sostratus points to his supreme abilities as an architect. He was the engineer who probably diverted the Nile River to flood Memphis when that city rebelled against Ptolemy I, and he is also credited with being the first person to erect a suspended corridor, which he did in the Greek city of Nidos around 310 BC. Alexandria and the Pharos lighthouse ultimately became a battleground when Caesar sailed to Alexandria to end the civil war in Egypt between the two factions of the royal house, but soon found himself embroiled in an urban war now known as the Alexandrian War. In the process, the Pharos island became the beachhead for Caesar's troops, and Caesar later provided details in his commentaries. He burnt all those ships and the rest that were in the docks, because he could not protect so wide an extent with his small force, and at once he embarked his men and landed them on Pharos. Caesar then went on to give a detailed account of the lighthouse and island that corroborates much of what Strabo wrote. On the island there is a tower called Pharos, of great height, a work of wonderful construction, which took its name from the island. This island, lying over against Alexandria, makes a harbour, but it is connected with the town by a narrow roadway like a bridge, piers, nine hundred feet in length, having been thrown out seawards by former kings. On this island there are dwelling houses of Egyptians and a settlement the size of a town, and any ships that went a little out of their course there, through carelessness or rough weather, they were in the habit of plundering like pirates. Moreover, on account of the narrowness of the passage, there can be no entry for ships into the harbour without the consent of those who are in occupation of Pharos. Caesar, now fearing such difficulty, landed his troops when the enemy was occupied in fighting, and seized Pharos and placed a garrison on it. The result of these measures was that corn and reinforcements could be safely conveyed to him on shipboard. As Strabo and Caesar both suggest, the lighthouse not only warned mariners about shoals, but also helped ward off piracy. Up to that time, according to 1st century BC Greek historians, like Diodorus Sicilus of Sicily and Strabo, Pharos had been a haven for pirates. The 4th century Hellenic tyrant Dionysus I of Syracuse cleaned the pirates out of the western Mediterranean and established a settlement at Pharos, but piracy quickly returned after his death. The establishment of the lighthouse helped deter the pirates from re-establishing themselves on the island and threatening mariners or the nearby newly founded city. Caesar's description of the Pharos lighthouse and island differ from Strabo's, only in that the details are focused more on logistics, which should be expected from a military commander. He noted the native Egyptian settlement on the island, but most importantly, Caesar saw the importance of the island as an entry point and harbour where his legions could receive much-needed supplies. Like any good leader, Caesar knew how to reward his troops, so after they established the beachhead there, he allowed the Romans to plunder the Pharos island. After granting his soldiers leave to plunder, Caesar ordered the buildings to be demolished. Near the bridge, the one closer to Pharos, he fortified a redoubt and posted a garrison there. This bridge the inhabitants of Pharos had abandoned in their fight. It is unknown if one of the buildings damaged in the plundering was the lighthouse, but it would be safe to assume that if Caesar saw or knew of his legions purposefully damaging it, he would have put an end to such actions. After all, if a supreme military tactician like Caesar understood the strategic importance of the Alexandrian harbour and Pharos island, then he also knew that the lighthouse made the harbour superior to others. Caesar's description of the Pharos island places the lighthouse in the context of historical events better than any other writer, but other ancient writers also offered valuable information about the monument. Not long after Strabo and Caesar wrote their accounts of the Pharos lighthouse, the 1st century AD Jewish historian Josephus offered a much more detailed account of the difficulties that the harbour of Alexandria, 
and coastal Egypt in general pose to Mediterranean mariners. He wrote, For Egypt is difficult to enter by land, and the coast is almost harbourless. It is difficult even in peacetime for ships to approach the harbour of Alexandria. The entrance is narrow, and submerged rocks make a straight course impossible. The left side is shut in by artificial moles. On the right, the island of Pharos lies offshore, and from this rises an enormous lighthouse, whose fires are visible thirty-five miles away, warning visiting ships to anchor at night well away from the shore because of the difficulty of making port. Josephus offers two more important facts to the corpus of ancient descriptions of the Pharos lighthouse. First, he graphically described the physical problems that the Egyptian coastline posed, and thus why the lighthouse was indispensable to sailors at the time. Second, he mentions that the lighthouse was a true lighthouse, and its light could be seen from quite some distance, an important point that is discussed later. Historians were not the only ancient writers to mention the Pharos lighthouse in their works. The second-century A.D. writer Lucian wrote about the Pharos lighthouse in his book Icaromanippus, or The Skyman. Lucian was a Syrian who wrote fictional and even science fiction prose in the Greek language, and in the Icaromanippus, one of the main characters mentions the Pharos lighthouse as one of the tallest monuments of the world. In the first place, imagine that the earth you see is very small, far less than the moon, I mean, so that when I suddenly peer down, I was long uncertain where the big mountains and the great sea were, and if I had not spied the Colossus of Rhodes and the lighthouse on Pharos, I vow I shouldn't have known the earth at all. Lucian, one of Rome's best satirists, also claimed that Sostratus was forbidden by Ptolemy II from signing the Pharos lighthouse, but came up with a clever way of doing so anyway. According to the satirist, Sostratus had his name carved into the base and then covered with plaster, so that long after both his and Ptolemy's deaths, the plaster wore away and exposed him as the architect. Clearly, some of the best-known writers of the ancient world were so impressed with the Pharos lighthouse that they described it in their works, but they are not the only ancient primary source that describes the monument. Although the Romans were not the first people to invent or use coins, they made their presence ubiquitous throughout their empire, as coins became the standard form of currency. Roman coins often depicted their great leaders and various monuments, one of which was the Pharos Lighthouse. After Cleopatra VII and Mark Antony lost to Octavian's forces during the civil wars, Egypt became part of the Roman Empire in 30 BC, but even if the transfer of Egypt's power from the Ptolemies to the Romans may have signaled a decline in Alexandria's cultural influence, it did not diminish the city's economic importance. A mint was built in Alexandria to make Roman coins, and one of the most popular coins made there was the Pharos coins. Pharos coins were issued through six imperial reigns, from Domitian through Marcus Aurelius, and then again briefly during the rule of Commodus, A.D. 181 to 192. The Pharos lighthouse is depicted on most of these coins as a three-tiered structure with a statue of Zeus at the top. The visual depictions of the Pharos lighthouse on Roman coins were not the only visual or artistic representations made, as several mosaics were also created that depict the monument. The medieval mosaics that depicted the Pharos lighthouse ranged in distance from Libya to Jordan and St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice, and although they were separated by hundreds of miles and several centuries, all of the mosaics depict the lighthouse as a three-tiered structure. Interestingly, these ancient depictions are at odds with Arab accounts from the Middle Ages. One Arab traveller named al-Bakri described the lighthouse in detail. The Pharos today is composed of four stages. The first, of a rectangular design, is remarkably built in rectangular cut stones, of which the joints are so well concealed that the whole seems to be formed of a single block of stone remaining insensible to the ravages of time. Its height is 320 cubits. At the top of the first stage, one is left with, by each face of the building, a space corresponding to the thickness of the wall being eight spans, plus around ten extra cubits on the surface, which encloses the platform. One goes up to the second stage of the construction, which affects an octagonal plan, and a height of eighty cubits. On the periphery of the second platform, one is left with a space corresponding to the width of the wall of the second stage, plus eight cubits. 
and from this enclosed surface one ascends to a closing element of the construction, a rectangular design with a height of around 50 cubits. At the top one finds a prayer chapel attributed to Solomon. On the northern face of the edifice is found an inscription in copper. No one has been able to decipher it, nor knows to what it corresponds. The door of the pharos is of iron, and nobody knows when it was made. One goes up towards the door on departing from the foundation of the lighthouse by an inclined road without noticing the incline. Likewise, one reaches the top of the first stage by an incline wide enough to permit the passage of two horsemen riding side by side on ground appearing so flat that those who go up would not be able to say they are climbing or simply walking. At each of the bends of this incline is found a door to quarters, in the interior of which are found rooms ten to twenty cubits square, exposing garret windows and vents, designed to air out the smallest gust of wind against the lighthouse, which without them would run the risk of it collapsing. There are in the interior of the lighthouse three hundred and sixty-four rooms. With regard to the bends of the ramp, they make up from bottom to top a total of seventy-two, and each allows twelve steps of progression. All these rooms are covered with an arch of stones matched and cemented. The whole structure constituting the lighthouse has its components of masonry tied together by beams of teak wood. Another Arab writer, Abu Haggag Yusuf ibn el Andalusi, also offered a detailed account circa 1165 AD. The Pharos rises at the end of the island. The building is square, about eight and a half meters, twenty-eight feet each side. The sea surrounds the pharos except on the east and south sides. This platform measures along its sides, from the tip down to the foot of the pharos walls, six and a half meters, twenty-one feet in height. However, on the sea side, it is larger because of the construction, and is steeply inclined like the side of a mountain. As the height of the platform increases towards the walls of the pharos, its width narrows, until it arrives at the measurements above. The doorway to the pharos is high up. A ramp about 183 meters, 600 feet long, is used to lead up to it. This ramp rests on a series of curved arches. My companion got beneath one of the arches and stretched out his arms, but he was not able to reach the sides. There are 16 of these arches, each gradually getting higher until the doorway is reached, the last one being especially high. These Arab accounts are especially helpful in their description of the ramp and the doorway. Based on these descriptions, it seems the lighthouse had an internal spiral ramp, large enough to accommodate animals dragging fuel in carts. Reports also mentioned a dumb waiter for the purpose of bringing wood up to the top of the lighthouse to feed the fire. All of these measurements are approximate, since they were reported, like the pyramids, in cubits, an ancient measurement of widely varying lengths but they were far less ludicrous than other assertions about the use of the lighthouse. In fact, while the inventions ascribed to the Pharos lighthouse were the most technologically advanced of the Seven Wonders, with the possible exception of the mysterious and perhaps legendary hanging gardens of Babylon, none of them was beyond the abilities of the Greeks or Egyptians at that time. Archaeologists have determined that the Egyptians used ramps in the building of the pyramids some 2,000 years before the building of the lighthouse. An early step pyramid northwest of Memphis, the 4,700-year-old Pyramid of Djoser, reached nearly 200 feet in height and could have inspired the builders of the Pharos lighthouse. Another possible inspiration came from early ziggurats in Mesopotamia, built during the same period as the Djoser Pyramid, and reaching 100 to 175 feet in height. The shape of the lighthouse on coins, mosaics, and by later artists after its destruction show it as a structure with a square base, octagon middle section, and a circular top, although later Islamic sources report that a mosque was placed on top before its eventual destruction. However, determining the height of the Pharos lighthouse is a more difficult endeavor since none of the artistic depiction shows accurate perspective and none of the written sources give any accurate estimates. Due to this quandary, scholars are left to make educated guesses on the lighthouse's height, and most scholars believe that the Pharos lighthouse stood between 350 and 600 feet tall, with one of the more reasoned arguments coming from Peter Clayton. Clayton argues that the total height of the lighthouse was 100 meters, around 350 feet, which he arrived at by estimating that the sections of monument, 
were 60, 30, then 15 meters successively stacked. Conversely, Josephus' claim that light from the Pharos lighthouse could be seen for 35 miles led Thomas Clare to point out that if the ancient historian's account is correct, then a lighthouse height of around 450 feet would closely match the visibility range. That said, until a record is discovered that can definitively state how tall the lighthouse was, any attempts to do so will remain guesswork. The shape and height were the Pharos lighthouse's most apparent, and to some extent, most marketable features, but other aspects are also of interest to historians. On most artistic depictions of the Pharos lighthouse, there is a statue on the very top, and most scholars believe that the statue was of Zeus Sota, the patron god of the Pharos. Various coins also depict the Egyptian goddess Isis next to the lighthouse. Isis was the Egyptian goddess of magic who came to be worshipped by many Greeks and Romans in post-Pharaonic times as part of a mystery cult that increasingly associated Isis with fertility and motherhood. The Romans spread the Isis cult throughout their empire from Britain to Mesopotamia until it became one of the more popular cults in Rome, so it should be no surprise that her image appears on Roman coins. However, Susan Handler believes that the image of Isis next to the Pharos lighthouse on Roman coins depicted an actual statue, and that there was probably a cult placed in her honor on Pharos Island. Like so many of the other major monuments built in Alexandria during the rule of the Ptolemies, including the Serapium, the Library, and Alexander the Great's tomb, the Pharos lighthouse eventually disappeared with time. This is not terribly surprising, given that of all the seven wonders of the ancient world, only Khufu's great pyramid in Giza still stands among those illustrious monuments that once grasped the imagination of people throughout the world. An apocryphal tale claims that the Pharos lighthouse was dismantled in 850 CE through trickery. A Byzantine emperor, seeking to rid the Mediterranean of rival ports, tricked the caliph in Cairo into dismantling the lighthouse, under the impression that treasure lay beneath it. Once aware of the ruse, the caliph attempted to rebuild the lighthouse, but was unsuccessful. However, this story is clearly belied by witness accounts in 1115 to the continued existence of the Pharos lighthouse, as well as the continued success of Alexandria as a port. Some wonders were indeed destroyed by men, but it appears the Pharos lighthouse was the victim of a combination of natural and economic factors with earthquakes being the major factor in the initial demise of the Pharos lighthouse. A large earthquake, which was felt as far away as Syria, destroyed the upper part of the lighthouse in 956, and when other earthquakes followed, local officials apparently did not see the need to rebuild the lighthouse after the Romans. When the famous Islamic historian and geographer Ibn Battuta visited Alexandria in 1326, he noticed that it was partially in ruins, but when he returned in 1349, it was almost completely destroyed. Although the Pharos lighthouse's beacon was extinguished forever during the Middle Ages, it left a permanent influence on the world. The Pharos lighthouse was the world's first true lighthouse, so all others built since have followed its architecture to some degree, and the design of the Pharos lighthouse served as a template for lighthouses throughout the ancient Mediterranean, as evidenced by numerous mosaics and sarcophagi reliefs that depict other lighthouses from the same period. There were numerous lighthouses that were modeled specifically on the Pharos lighthouse's design, which included ones at Ostia, Ravenna, Syria, and Dalmatia. The Pharos lighthouse's inspiration to other similar structures was noted by Strabo. Hereabouts is the Oracle of Menestheus, and also the Tower of Scipio, which is situated upon a rock that is washed on all sides by the waves, and, like the Pharos Tower, is a marvellous structure built for the sake of the safety of mariners. Chapter 4. The Ptolemies Due to his efforts and the landmarks associated with him, Ptolemy II is best remembered as a cultural patron, but he also introduced a bizarre marriage practice in order to further legitimize Greek rule in Egypt. Since the Ptolemies were foreigners in Egypt, they had to carefully portray their rule as legitimate, which in Egypt meant divine rule. The dynasty got off to a solid start when Alexander the Great was proclaimed the son of the Egyptian god Amun by the oracle of Siwa, but later Greek kings were forced to devise new ideas concerning legitimacy. 
Ptolemy I had Alexander's body brought to Alexandria and then had a royal necropolis built as part of his palace. But Ptolemy II decided to use a very different tactic, incestuous marriage. Around 276 BCE, Ptolemy II married his sister, Arsino II, and placed her on the throne next to him in Alexandria. The concept of incestuous marriage was foreign, and for the most part detestable to the Greeks, but the marriage was probably done, at least partially, for the benefits of the Egyptians. The Greeks, and the Romans after them, were often enamoured, somewhat superficially, with the civilizations that came before them, such as the Egyptians and Mesopotamians. The Ptolemies saw the Egyptian myth of Isis and Osiris, who were brother and sister, but also king and queen, as an acceptable template for their rule in Egypt. Little did the Ptolemies know that royal incestuous marriages were extremely rare in Pharaonic Egypt, and marriages between full brother and sister were almost non-existent. Overall, Ptolemy II's rule was a golden age for both Alexandria and the Ptolemaic dynasty. Overall, Ptolemy II's rule was a golden age for both Alexandria and the Ptolemaic dynasty, which in many ways was carried on by his successor. Ptolemy III, who became king in 246 BC, attempted to extend Ptolemaic power beyond Egypt and also followed some of his predecessor's domestic programs. He invaded the Levant, which was part of the Seleucid Empire, and was able to temporarily assume partial control of the region. The profits gained by Ptolemy III's successful campaign were used to maintain a formidable army, and perhaps more importantly, to continue his successor's mission of making Alexandria the greatest city in the world. Ptolemy III gave Egypt over twenty years of stable rule and helped to keep Alexandria as a cultural capital, but after his rule, problems became the norm in Alexandria for the remainder of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Egypt and Alexandria were plagued with a succession of weak yet tyrannical rulers from 221 to 30 BCE, and their actions often thrust the city into full-scale rebellion. The death of Ptolemy IV in 205 BCE threatened the stability of all Egypt when a group of native priests in Upper Egypt supported a rival Egyptian to assume the throne. Despite the large-scale rebellion in the southern end of Egypt, Alexandria remained loyal to the Ptolemies for the most part. The native Egyptian rebellion was finally suppressed by Ptolemy V in 186 BC, which is commemorated on the renowned Rosetta Stone. The problems that Egypt and Alexandria experienced under Ptolemy IV and V were magnified under the later Ptolemy kings, as the Alexandrian mob became a major political player and kingmaker. Ptolemy VII is one of the more interesting Ptolemy kings because he was king twice and earned the nickname Fiscon, the Fat, due to his excessive gluttony. After his first unsuccessful try at the throne, he was exiled to Cyrene, but he returned several years later after his brother, Ptolemy VI, died in a military campaign in the east. Ptolemy VII's return to Alexandria was greeted with derision from both the city's elite and the mob which he repaid with a wave of repression. In particular, Ptolemy VII focused his wrath on Alexandria's intellectuals by forcing them into exile, and ultimately reducing the city's well-earned academic reputation to an also-ran. The end of Ptolemy VII's rule brought a temporary reprieve to the citizens of Alexandria, but they would later experience a much worse leader. Ptolemy XII was nicknamed Eleutes, the flutist, because he loved music and the finer things in life. He, like many of his predecessors, married his sister Cleopatra VI after he murdered his first wife in order to assume the throne. However, Ptolemy XII quickly found himself in an impossible situation, as on the one hand he was obliged to the Alexandrian mob, which could rebel and remove him from power, and on the other hand he faced the prospect of Roman intervention. As Orletes precariously tried to balance both powers, he was doomed to fail. Strabo wrote about Ptolemy XII's demise and some of the other less illustrious Ptolemaic kings. But Philometor was succeeded by a brother, the second Ergetes, who was also called Fiscon, and he, by the Ptolemy, nicknamed Lathurus, and he by Orletes, from our time, who was the father of Cleopatra. Now all the kings after the third Ptolemy, being corrupted by luxurious living, have administered the affairs of government badly, but worst of all, 
the fourth, seventh, and the last Orletes, who, apart from his general licentiousness, practised the accompaniment of choruses with a flute, and upon this he prided himself so much that he would not hesitate to celebrate contests in the royal palace, and at these contests would come forward to vie with the opposing contestants. He, however, was banished by the Alexandrians. After Ptolemy the Twelfth's downfall, Alexandria would be the scene to one of the greatest dramas in the world, the struggle for power between Cleopatra the Seventh and the Roman Empire. During the first century BCE, Rome was gripped by several rounds of civil wars that ultimately turned the Republic into an empire. Although the civil wars were fought for control of Rome, the city of Alexandria played a sizable role in the eventual outcome of the wars. In 48 BCE, Roman general and later dictator for life Julius Caesar arrived in Alexandria under the auspices that he would quell the disturbances that arose after the death of Ptolemy XII. Caesar underestimated the situation in Alexandria, though, as the situation devolved into urban warfare, known by historians as the Alexandrian War, after the young Ptolemy XIII died. It was while Caesar was in Alexandria that he met and courted the future Ptolemaic queen Cleopatra the Seventh. The manner in which Cleopatra became the ruler of Egypt was a bit complicated, as Strabo noted. But before he had added much time to his reign, he died of disease, leaving behind two sons and also two daughters, the eldest daughter being Cleopatra. But the associates of the boy caused an uprising and banished Cleopatra, and she set sail with her sister to Syria. In the meantime, Pompey the Great had come in flight from Pelifasalus to Pelusium and Mount Cassius. Now Pompey was treacherously slain by the king's party, but when Caesar arrived, he put the lad to death, and having summoned Cleopatra from exile, established her as Queen of Egypt. Eventually, Caesar and Cleopatra developed a well-known relationship that produced one son. Cleopatra was not the only queen Caesar romanced, but she was the most important. The second-century C.E. Roman biographer Suetonius wrote, The most famous of these queens was Cleopatra. He often feasted with her until dawn, and they would have sailed together in her state barge nearly to Ethiopia had his soldiers consented to follow him. He eventually summoned Cleopatra to Rome and would not let her return home without high titles and rich presents. He even allowed her to give his own name to the son whom she had borne him. Some Greek historians say that the boy closely resembled Caesar in features as well as in gait. Mark Antony informed the Senate that Caesar had in fact acknowledged his paternity, and that other friends of Caesar, including Gaius Matius and Gaius Oppius, were aware of this. However, tragedy struck when Caesar was assassinated in the Senate on March 15, 44 BCE, and that would ignite another round of the civil wars. After Caesar's assassination, his nephew Octavian and his army comrade Mark Antony initially allied with each other against Brutus and Cassius. But once those foes were defeated, the two men turned against each other. Cleopatra VII inserted herself into the situation by developing a relationship with Antony in the belief that he would defeat his younger foe, become the ruler of Rome, and allow Egypt to remain an independent kingdom. Cleopatra's logic was sound, but things did not go as planned when Antony's forces were defeated by Octavian at Actium in 31 BCE. After their loss to Octavian, Antony and Cleopatra fled to Alexandria, where they both eventually died. The details of their deaths remain somewhat shrouded in mystery, at least partially because of modern fictional narratives such as Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, but Strabo wrote an account that appears fairly accurate. Augustus Caesar honoured this place because it was here that he conquered in battle those who came out against him with Antony, and when he had taken the city at the first onset, he forced Antony to put himself to death and Cleopatra to come into his power alive, but a little later she too put herself to death secretly while in prison by the bit of an asp, or, for two accounts are given, by applying a poisonous ointment and the result was that the empire of the sons of Lagos, which had endured for many years, was dissolved. Cleopatra VII's death marked the end of the Ptolemaic dynasty and the last time that Alexandria would serve as a political capital, but the city's influence was far from finished. Chapter 5. The Romans and Alexandria After the deaths of Antony and Cleopatra VII, Rome became an empire, 
Octavian took the title Princeps, Emperor, and he became known as Augustus. Egypt became a province in the Roman Empire, but Alexandria's importance continued even under Roman rule. Shortly after Octavian became sole master of the Roman Empire, he toured Alexandria in order to assess what role it would play in the greater empire. Octavian immediately recognized the importance of Alexandria, but he also saw that it was vastly different from Rome. Rome was the seat of Roman political power and the hub of European economic and cultural activity, but it was light years behind Alexandria in those two respects, and there was little he or any other Roman could do about it. For that reason, the Romans decided to exploit the Egyptian city's potential. According to Suetonius, after visiting the tomb of Alexander in Alexandria, Augustus set out on a program intended to harness Egypt's full economic potential. About this time, he had the sarcophagus containing Alexander the Great's mummy removed from the mausoleum at Alexandria, and after a long look at its features, showed his veneration by crowning the head with a golden diadem and stewing flowers on the trunk. When asked, Would you now like to visit the mausoleum of the Ptolemies? He replied, I came to see a king, not a row of corpses. Augustus turned the kingdom of Egypt into a Roman province, and then, to increase its fertility and its yield of grain for the Roman market, set troops to clean out the irrigation canals of the Nile, which had silted up after many years of neglect. Augustus then returned to Rome, where he initiated his own building campaign that was probably at least partially inspired by the greatness of Alexandria. At the time, Rome paled in comparison to Alexandria from an intellectual standpoint, so to remedy the situation, Roman emperors imported Greek scholars and books to Rome. Augustus probably also imported the idea of libraries after his visit to Alexandria. According to Suetonius, the Temple of Apollo was erected in the part of his house on the Palatine, to which the Heruspices said the god had drawn attention by having it struck with lightning. The colonnades running out from it housed Latin and Greek libraries, and in his declining years Augustus frequently held meetings of the Senate in the nave, or revised jury lists there. No Roman sources mention any major libraries in Rome before Augustus, so it is logical to assume that the emperor brought the idea home after he visited Alexandria. Alexandria continued to be an important city in the Roman Empire, as later emperors became influenced by the local culture. The next four emperors after Augustus paid little attention to Alexandria or Egypt, as their resources were primarily spent in Europe, but Vespasian, ruled 69-79, to 79, attained Rome's highest office through his actions in Alexandria. While Vespasian was serving as a general in the Levant, domestic turmoil that began during the reign of Nero gripped Rome. Vespasian saw an opening and with his sizable and loyal army, he decided to take the highest office by force. From the Levant, Vespasian and his army marched to Egypt, where they took the strategically and symbolically important city of Alexandria. Suetonius wrote, So Vespasian began a new civil war. Having sent troops ahead to Italy, he himself crossed over to Alexandria, so that he might occupy this key to Egypt. There he dismissed his companions and entered the temple of Serapis alone to consult the auspices and discover how long he would last as emperor. Vespasian's patronage of the Serapis cult is important because it demonstrates the Romans' desire to be accepted by the people of Alexandria. Like Alexander the Great nearly 400 years before him, Vespasian saw the need to be accepted in a religious context by the Egyptians. The extent to which Vespasian patronized the Alexandrian deity Serapis is unknown, but during his reign, the cult of the Egyptian goddess Isis achieved official public status in Rome. Also, Roman artists began to use Isis and Serapis-themed motifs to adorn the walls of Italian villas during this period, which points to the continued cultural influence of Alexandria. Alexandria's cultural allure was also not lost on Vespasian's son and successor, Titus. Although Titus was only emperor for a short while, from 79 to 81, Suetonius was able to write several pages about the emperor. Before Titus became emperor, many believed that he was trying to use the legions under his command to establish his own kingdom in the eastern provinces. 
After he destroyed Jerusalem and the Second Temple in 70, he marched to Egypt, which led many Romans to worry he was attempting a coup. According to Suetonius, the rumor was more than likely the result of cultural misunderstanding. Such passionate devotion aroused a suspicion that he planned to usurp his father's power in the east, especially since he had worn a diadem while attending the consecration of the Apis bull at Memphis on his way to Alexandria. But this was a gross slander on his conduct, which accorded with ancient ritual. Titus sailed for Italy at once in a naval transport, touching at Regium and Puteoli. Hurrying on to Rome, he exploded all the false rumors by greeting Vespasian, who had not been expecting him, with the simple words, Here I am, Father, here I am. The passage demonstrates that Alexandria was still an important city in the first century CE, and that the Romans still recognized some of the native Egyptian cults. Alexandria may not have been as important to the Romans as it was to the Ptolemies, but the former recognized the city's continuing importance. Of course, the Romans also contributed to the culture of Alexandria during their rule over Egypt. The exchange of ideas in the ancient Mediterranean often took a circuitous course, as some traveled to different lands and changed as they went before coming back to their places of origin. The philosophy of Stoicism is an example of such an idea. Stoicism originated in Athens, but it later spread throughout the Roman Empire and became popular with many of the Roman emperors, namely Marcus Aurelius, who wrote a book of Stoic aphorisms. By the time Nero became emperor, 54 to 68, there were plenty of Stoic philosophers in Rome, including Seneca the Younger, who was one of his teachers. The emperor also called on the Stoic, Cirmon of Alexandria, to help finish his education. The educational reputation of Alexandria also held an allure for the Emperor Domitian, ruled 81 to 96, who used the Library of Alexandria to restock the libraries of Rome. Suetonius explained, At the beginning of his reign, he abandoned the study of literature, even though he went to a great deal of trouble and expense in restocking the burned out libraries, hunting all over for lost volumes, and sending people to Alexandria to transcribe and correct them. The intellectual life of Alexandria clearly had an effect on the early Roman emperors, but the Romans also influenced Alexandria, primarily through the construction of buildings and monuments. Today, when people travel to Alexandria, the only ancient sites available for viewing are from the Roman period. The most visible monuments include the misnamed Pompey's Pillar, which stands nearly 70 feet tall and was erected during the reign of Diocletian, ruled 284-305. to 305. During the Roman period, Pompey's Pillar would have been the third tallest structure in Egypt after the Great Pyramids and the Pharos Lighthouse, respectively. But since the lighthouse is now gone, it occupies the second position. The height of Pompey's Pillar is contrasted with the subterranean catacombs of Qom el Shukafa, which snaked for several levels beneath the streets of ancient Alexandria. The catacombs, which were built in the 2nd century CE, present a unique perspective of the Romans' interpretations of Egyptian religion, as the walls are adorned with scenes of pharaonic deities dressed in Roman clothing, thus rendered in the Roman artistic style. The best preserved of all the Roman period sites in Alexandria is the amphitheatre of Com el Dic. In terms of public entertainment, the amphitheatre was used for dramatic performances and chariot races, but it also formed part of the physical meeting place for later scholarly communities. Chapter 6. Alexandrian Culture The culture of Alexandria did not diminish under the Romans, but its peak was clearly under the Ptolemies. The Greeks and Romans both paid considerable attention to Alexandria, partially because it was located in the wealthy country of Egypt, but primarily because the culture of the city exerted an undeniable attraction. Alexandria's culture was Hellenistic at its core, but it also possessed a veneer of pharaonic attributes, along with Roman, Byzantine, and early Christian features that were added later. As already discussed, part of the reason why Alexandria became a cultural jewel was because the early Ptolemy rulers patronized the arts, and dedicated resources to building projects. But other factors also contributed to make Alexandria as culturally unique as it was powerful. One of the salient features of early Alexandrian culture was its unique manifestation of a syncretic version of Greek and Egyptian religion. 
Alexander the Great chose to associate with the Egyptian god Amun, while Ptolemy I established the cult of Serapis to be the new deity of his dynasty. The Egyptian influence on the Serapis cult was quite profound, as its primary creator-inventor was the Egyptian priest Manetho, and the deity itself was based on the Egyptian bovine god, the Apis Bull. By the time the Serapis cult was created, the cult of the Apis Bull was probably 2,000 years old, but it reached the height of its popularity later during the 26th dynasty, 664 to 525 BCE. The Apis cult theology and mythology revolved around the belief that a sacred bull who had special markings lived and should be venerated in a special place in Memphis. The Egyptians believed that the living Apis bull carried the spirit of Osiris, the god of the dead, and upon the bull's death it should be properly mummified and a replacement found. The Ptolemies recognized the importance of the Apis cult to the Egyptians culturally and politically and so they sought to find a way to patronize the cult in Alexandria in a way that fit their Greek sensibilities. Nonetheless, the Ptolemies found themselves in a quandary when it came to the Apis bull, since the idea of worshipping a bull was both foreign and distasteful to the Greeks, and the center of the cult was far from Alexandria in Memphis. In order to manipulate the situation to their advantage, the Ptolemies chose Manetho, a man with feet in both the Greek and Egyptian worlds, to help fashion a new cult that was acceptable to both groups and based in Alexandria. The result was Serapis, which was a composite of the Egyptian deities Apis and Osiris, and the Greek Zeus. The new cult was vastly different from its Egyptian predecessor in that there were no live bulls associated with it, and its temple also served as a library and center of learning for Alexandria. The Serapis cult is the best representation of how the elite power structure in Alexandria wanted to portray itself to the masses, but the masses of Alexandria also developed their own unique culture. When the Greeks took control of Egypt, they overlaid many of their own ideas and rulers on top of the already existing pharaonic culture. One of the initial results of Greek rule in Egypt was the foundation of Alexandria, but with it also came a large influx of Greek immigrants to Egypt particularly to the newly built city. The result of Greek immigration was that Egypt became increasingly multicultural and bilingual, especially in Alexandria. Alexandria was divided into ethnic quarters, but members of each group tended to self-segregate for the most part. For instance, the native Egyptians, especially outside of Alexandria, tended to support the millennia-old pharaonic cults, while the Greeks clung to theirs. The Serapis cult, which was ultimately intended to bridge the cultural gap between Greeks and Egyptians, never gained much traction in Egypt outside of Alexandria. Outside of Alexandria, the native Egyptian cults continued much as they had for over 2,000 years. And even in Alexandria, Egyptians clung obstinately to their old gods. In one anecdotal account, Strabo noted how the streets of Alexandria were full of ibises, which were sacred animals to the Egyptians. The ibis, however, is the tamest bird. It is like a stork in shape and size, but it is of two kinds in color, one kind like the stork and the other black all over. Every crossroad in Alexandria is full of them, and though they are useful in one way, they are not useful in another. The bird is useful because it singles out every animal and the refuse in the meat shops and bakeries, but not useful because it eats everything, is unclean, and can only, with difficulty, be kept away from things that are clean and do not admit of any defilement. The ibises of Alexandria may have been a nuisance to Strabo and the other Greek inhabitants, but to the native Egyptians they were sacred birds that were meant to be left alone. By the time of Roman rule, Alexandria had a culture where ethnic and religious identity played a major role in daily life, which sometimes spiraled into communal violence, especially during the early Christian period. Alexandrian culture was certainly diverse, but what made Alexandria truly great was its intellectual foundation. Alexandria became synonymous with learning and education in the ancient world, largely because the first two Ptolemies took the time and spent the resources on developing the city as an intellectual center. At the heart of Alexandria's intellectual life was the Library of Alexandria, which was actually part of the so-called Museon. The Museon was a group of scholars and poets that the first two Ptolemies collected in order to make Alexandria the cultural beacon of the Mediterranean. 
Despite the first two Ptolemies' dedication to the intellectual arts, their program focused on certain disciplines to the detriment of others. For example, history and library science were performed and advanced at the Library of Alexandria, while other sciences were promoted in other parts of the city. For example, mathematics was done by Euclid, Ptolemy, the scholar, not the king, advanced geography and cartography. And Strato of Lapsakos worked on his revolutionary ideas of physics for a while in Alexandria. About the only intellectual discipline that was not well represented in Alexandria was philosophy, although some notable Stoics later found a home in the city. Many of the scholars formulated ideas that would influence the world for centuries, but none more so than Ptolemy. The geographer and cartographer Ptolemy was born Claudius Ptolemaeus, around 100 CE in Alexandria. Ptolemy began his academic career by researching astronomy, which led to his revolutionary idea that numerical coordinates could be used to determine geographical locations. From the time of Ptolemy until well after the Renaissance, Ptolemy's research provided scholars with three essential things, a detailed map of Europe, Africa and Asia that was more complete than any other, a summary of the role astronomy plays in cartography, and a detailed formula for the creation of maps. Although Ptolemy did not invent or discover longitude and latitude, he introduced the idea of writing the coordinates down for every feature on his maps, which meant that anyone could reproduce one of his maps to any scale. It should also be noted that all of Ptolemy's maps depicted the Earth as a globe, as Greek scholars knew the plane was a sphere by the 5th century BCE. Ptolemy's advances in geography and cartography helped make Alexandria an intellectual hotspot, but it was in medicine that the city truly excelled. The medical advances made in ancient Alexandria proved to be some of the greatest intellectual advances in history, as most were not surpassed until the 17th century CE. The two greatest doctors and medical researchers to come from Alexandria were Herophilus of Chalcedon, circa 335 to 255 BCE, and Erasistratus of Sios, circa 304 to 250 BCE. And although the two men wrote many scholarly treatises, unfortunately they only survive in the fragmentary writings of later scholars. The two men were contemporaries of each other, but there is no evidence that suggests they ever worked together, or even knew of one another. Both men lived and worked during Alexandria's Golden Age under the first two Ptolemies, so at the time they were just two of a legion of scholars that populated the narrow streets of the city. The medical advances made in Alexandria by these and other men were at least partially facilitated by and the result of some of the first human dissections. Where these Greek scholars first derived the idea of human dissection is unknown, because it was not practiced in the Greek mainland before it was done in Alexandria. The absence of dissection in Greek medical practice before Alexandria has led some scholars to believe that Herophilus and Erisistratus were influenced by the Egyptians, who were well acquainted with the human body through the process of mummification. But Longrig has argued that such ideas have overlooked the fact that in Egypt the religious taboos surrounding the dead and the disposal of the body were so strong and that ultimately there is no evidence to suggest that the Greek doctors in Alexandria derived any particular knowledge from Egyptian embalmers. Longrig is correct that there is no direct evidence, but accounts from the historian Manetto suggest that Egyptian anatomical knowledge may have been greater than they are often credited. According to Manetto, Jer, referred to as Atothus by Manetto, who was the second king of unified Egypt, the dates of his rule are unknown, but was sometime between 3000 and 2950 BCE, was a doctor and medical researcher. Manetta wrote, Atothus his son for 57 years. He built the palace at Memphis, and his anatomical works are extant, for he was a physician. Apparently, Manetto, who was able to read both Greek and Egyptian, came into contact with some type of medical papyrus from the early dynastic period, although the quality of the manuscript, medically speaking, is difficult to surmise. A number of medical papyri from the pharaonic period have survived, but such texts never give a detailed account of human anatomy. An Alexandrian named Clement, who was born around 150 CE, claims to have known about an Egyptian anatomy manuscript which one could argue corroborates Manetto's account, but the argument is somewhat circular. 
It is true that Egyptian religious ideas would have prevented them from dissecting human bodies for the sake of research, and there are no known Egyptian anatomy treatises that have survived, but it seems unwise to totally disregard any Egyptian influence on Alexandrian dissection research. The influence of the Egyptians on early Alexandrian dissection research can be debated, but there is no doubt that the Egyptians had no influence on possible cases of vivisection in Alexandria. According to the later writer Celsus, both Herophilus and Erasistratus vivisected criminals from the royal prisons, and although there is no corroborating evidence, it is easy to believe, when one considers the free hand that the first two Ptolemies gave to their army of scholars. It is interesting and perhaps telling that after Herophilus, dissection experiments in Alexandria ceased, but the careers of Herophilus and Erasistratus went far beyond dissection. In fact, they both conducted research that laid the foundations for the modern understanding of medicine. Herophilus both taught and practiced medicine, but he is best known for his revolutionary research in the field of the brain, eye, nervous and vascular systems, the liver and the genital organs. In particular, Herophilus demonstrated the origin and course of the nerves from the brain and spinal cord, which proved to be, for the most part, accurate. Like Herophilus, Erasistratus also wrote a number of works that would later influence modern medical knowledge and techniques. Erasistratus compared the human brain to those of other mammals, and he also conducted the first serious research into metabolism. Unfortunately, many of the great advances made during the Golden Age of the first two Ptolemies was erased during the reign of Ptolemy VII when he expelled many of Alexandria's scholars in 145 BCE. Although the Romans attempted to replicate the Ptolemies in some ways by patronizing some intellectual pursuits, their attention was focused on Rome, so Alexandria's beacon as a cultural center waned. Although the intellectual aspects of Alexandria's culture may have declined with Ptolemy VII's rule, other aspects of culture, particularly sports and leisure, continue to play an important role in Alexandria. One of the hallmarks of any advanced society is the amount and type of recreation that its inhabitants enjoy. Today, people take part in watching professional sports, playing video games, and watching movies as part of their leisure activities and in ancient Alexandria, things were much the same. Obviously, Alexandrians did not have the electronic devices of today, but they were still able to devise a number of festivals and sporting events that not only kept them occupied, but also helped to demonstrate the uniqueness of the city itself. Festivals, both secular and religious, were an important part of the Alexandrian lifestyle, as they gave the people a chance to thank their gods and enjoy the wealth of the city. Festivals for Serapis had the tendency to get quite rowdy, at least according to Strabo, but to balance all this, the crowd of revelers who go down from Alexandria by the canal to the public festivals, for every day and every night is crowded with people on the boats who play the flute and dance without restraint and with extreme licentiousness, both men and women. The Egyptian calendar was full of religious festivals dedicated to their many gods and goddesses, which indicates that such festivals were apparently more important to them than the Greek. The Ptolemies, who acted as pharaohs, played the traditional role as facilitators of the festivals, but the priests and lay people alike took part in these festivals as well. Aside from the numerous Egyptian festivals, the most important of all Alexandrian festivals was the celebration of Alexandria's Greek heritage. Alexandria's Greek festival was known as the Ptolemaea, and as the name indicates, it was a thoroughly Hellenic celebration of the royal court and everything Greek about Alexandria. The Ptolemaea was decidedly non-Egyptian in its character. It was held every four years like the Olympics and also featured a number of sporting events. Other notable features of the Ptolemaea included a parade complete with floats that held mechanical statues. Essentially, the Ptolemaea was part sporting event and part royal propaganda, with the overall emphasis on the propaganda. Sporting events were a central component in the Ptolemaea, and sources reveal that they also played a key role in the larger Alexandrian culture. A number of extant primary sources reveal that Alexandrian Greeks, much like their European cousins, were quite fond of Olympic-style sporting events. An early 1st century AD inscription honors a man named Titus Flavius Archibius of Alexandria for 46 victories in a variety of different events. 
Another inscription dated to around 200 CE records Pancratian victories by a man named Marcus Aurelius Asclepiades in 181 in Olympia and again in 196 at the Alexandrian Olympics. For the most part, Alexandrians preferred the sports of the Greeks over the Romans, but there is at least one example of the Ptolemies attempting to use animals against their enemies in a public spectacle. Sometime during the reign of Ptolemy IV, the king attempted to force the Jews of Alexandria to worship the Greek god Dionysus, and those who refused were marched into a hippodrome full of elephants that were made aggressive through a combination of wine and incense. Unfortunately for Ptolemy, the elephants turned on his men. Animals continue to play a role in the entertainment of Alexandrians after the Ptolemies, but in a much less violent manner. After Alexandria's Greek history was long past, the Romans and Byzantine Greeks used the amphitheatre of Com El Dic for organised chariot races. The races themselves could be quite exciting and dangerous, but oftentimes the actual events were overshadowed by extreme acts of violence in the crowds, carried out by rival hooligan factions. Chapter 7. The Economic Importance of Alexandria Alexandria was truly a bustling city with many different festivals and sporting events, but one of the more overlooked aspects of Alexandrian culture was its economy. When Alexander the Great's generals divided his spoils, most believed that Ptolemy got the best deal with his acquisition of Egypt. Egypt was such a prize for Ptolemy because of its wealth. Egypt produced far more grain than any other country or kingdom at the time, and it also had access to gold and silver mines to its south. The primary problem with harnessing the wealth of Egypt was logistical in nature, as there was no major Egyptian city on the Mediterranean coastline. During the Pharaonic period, the Egyptians were not hampered much by not having a coastal city, since they could simply move trade up and down the Nile, and then either use overland routes to the north and south to get outside of Egypt, or use their river barges to sail along the Mediterranean coastline to the Levant. By the time of the Ptolemies, however, the system of the Mediterranean had changed dramatically, and a true coastal port was needed if Egypt was to remain an economically viable country. As already stated, Alexander was very particular about Alexandria's location, because, as it turns out, it was in a perfect place to facilitate trade to and from Egypt. On the coastal side of Alexandria were two natural harbours, which were separated by a man-made dike the Greeks called the Hepta Stadium. On Lake Mariotis, which is on Alexandria's south end, was a freshwater harbour that linked river-going vessels through a system of canals to the canopic branch of the Nile River, and ultimately to the main body of the Nile River. Strabo wrote a fairly detailed account of Alexandria's maritime trade advantages. The advantages of the city's site are various. For first, the place is washed by two seas, on the north by the Egyptian Sea, as it is called, and on the south by Lake Maria, also called Mariotis. This is filled by many canals from the Nile, both from above and on the sides, and through these canals the imports are much larger than those from the sea, so that the harbour on the lake was in fact richer than that on the sea, and here the exports from Alexandria are also larger than the imports, and anyone might judge, if he were at either Alexandria or Dicey Archaea, and saw the merchant vessels both at their arrival and at their departure, how much heavier or lighter they sailed thither or therefrom, and in addition to the great value of the things brought down from the sea and into that on the lake, the salubrity of the air is also worthy of remark. And this likewise results from the fact that the land is washed by water on both sides, and because of the timeliness of the Nile's risings. For the other cities that are situated on lakes have heavy and stifling air in the heats of summer, because the lakes then become marshy along their edges because of the evaporation caused by the sun's rays. Whereas at Alexandria, at the beginning of summer, the Nile, being full, fills the lake also, and leaves no marshy matter to corrupt the rising vapours. Later, the Romans built roads that connected Alexandria directly to the Nile River, and therefore with the world. Clearly, Alexandria was built with economic considerations in mind, as much as any high-minded Hellenistic ideals, and throughout its history it proved to be an especially lucrative city to those who held it.
Under the first few Ptolemies, Alexandria became just as famous for its economic output as for its intellectual achievements. Alexandrian merchants did business indirectly with India and China, as they exported grain, gold, papyri, and ivory, and imported such exotic items as silk and lapis lazuli. Ptolemy I established a central bank in Alexandria, and established a true monetary system in Egypt which allowed both him and Ptolemy II to be the primary creditors for many of Alexandria's early building projects. The overall economic system initiated by the Ptolemies was continued in many ways by the Romans, since Alexandria's economic importance did not wane under their rule. Alexandria continued to be the hub of economic activity in Egypt, and was the base for all incoming and outgoing trade throughout Roman rule. The Romans ruled Alexandria for much longer than the Ptolemies, but their time in Egypt was accentuated by inter-community ethnic and religious violence, as well as riots and rebellions aimed at the Roman rulers. Chapter 8. Alexandria and the Coptic Church Beginning in the first century CE, Alexandria was gripped by a new cultural influence, Christianity. As Christianity spread throughout the Middle East and Europe, and eventually became a dominant religion in those regions, Alexandria became a center, along with Rome and Constantinople, of early Christian culture and learning. Egyptian Christians, who became known as Copts, a name derived from the Greek word for Egypt, developed a unique culture that thrived under the Romans, Byzantines, and even later the Arabs, and still does today, as the Copts are the largest Christian community in the Middle East. Coptic history in Alexandria and all of Egypt is dominated by the fact that the Church and its followers faced centuries of oppression before gaining legitimacy. Initially they were marginalized somewhat by the Byzantine Christians, and then they suffered sporadic waves of oppression and repression again under Islamic rule. The Copts left an indelible mark on the history of Alexandria that can still be seen to this day thanks to numerous churches and cathedrals, and Alexandria remains the headquarters of the Coptic Church. According to Coptic tradition, the Coptic Church, also known as the Egyptian Orthodox Church, was founded by the Apostle Mark in Alexandria sometime during the first century CE. When Mark walked the streets of Alexandria, it would have looked much as it did under the Ptolemies. The lighthouse of Alexandria would have been the main attraction, the ports would have been bustling, and the library of Alexandria would have still been open, although it had suffered damage during the reign of Cleopatra the Seventh, The Copts wasted no time building cathedrals in Alexandria, Cairo, and Luxor, as well as monasteries in more remote locations. The early Egyptian Christians also quickly established a hierarchy within their church, with Alexandria as the seat of ecclesiastical power. The dates of the first few popes of the Coptic church are uncertain, but Demetrius I, the twelfth documented Coptic pope, is known to have held the office from 189 to 231. The leaders of the church also spent the first two centuries of its existence establishing its theological orthodoxy relatively unimpeded by the Roman authorities. Of course, this is not to say that there were never any problems between the Romans and Egyptians in Alexandria or anywhere else in Egypt, because many conflicts, often due to cultural misunderstanding, are documented by ancient historians. Diodorus wrote about one riot that broke out after a Roman soldier killed a cat. So deeply implanted also in the hearts of the common people is their superstitious regard for these animals, and so unalterable are the emotions cherished by every man regarding the honor due to them that once, at the time when Ptolemy, their king, had not as yet been given by the Romans the appellation of friend, and the people were exercising all zeal in courting the favor of the embassy from Italy, which was then visiting Egypt, and, in their fear, were intent upon giving no cause for complaint or war, when one of the Romans killed a cat, and the multitude rushed in a crowd to his house, neither the officials sent by the king to beg the man off, nor the fear of Rome, which all the people felt were enough to save the man from punishment, even though this act had been an accident. For the most part, such incidents, and the violence that accompanied it, were the exception, not the rule, as Romans and Egyptians lived fairly peacefully alongside each other in Alexandria and Egypt. The Romans were also fairly tolerant towards the early Coptic church, but that changed in the 3rd century. 
The 3rd century AD was a particularly difficult time in the Roman Empire, as the economy began to crumble and various subject peoples began to assert their independence. Each emperor dealt with the situation he faced differently, but beginning with the reign of Septimus Severus, ruled 193-211, to the persecution of Christians in Alexandria became routine. One of the most repressive decrees that Septimus Severus issued was the prohibition against conversion to Christianity. The prohibition against conversion was followed up during the reign of Valerian, 253-260, to with a decree that forced all Roman subjects to offer sacrifices to the gods or face severe penalties. The decree led to widespread resistance by church leaders and lay people alike. The Coptic Pope at the time, Dionysius, Pope from 247 to 264, was imprisoned and exiled to Libya. The persecution that the Coptic Church suffered resulted in a number of martyrs being officially proclaimed by the Church, which even included the Pope, Peter I, 300 to 311. Rome's war against the Coptic Church reached a fever pitch when the Emperor Diocletian, ruled 284 to 305, came to Alexandria. Diocletian was an ardent follower of the Roman gods, and for the most part he cared little for the Coptic Church, one way or another. However, in 297, Diocletian entered Alexandria with his legions in order to put down a revolt in the city caused by his taxation policies. As Diocletian came into contact with numerous Copts firsthand throughout Alexandria, he developed a hatred for them, based primarily on the fact that they did not recognize him as Divus, a divine ruler. In order to rectify the situation, Diocletian issued an edict on February the 23rd, 303, that stripped Christians of social rank and called for the churches to be destroyed and Christian manuscripts burned. The severe repression and destruction was chronicled by the 7th century Coptic bishop and historian John of Nicu, who wrote, And when Diocletian the Egyptian became emperor, the army turned to give its help to this impious man and persecutor of the faithful and the most wicked of all men, but the city of Alexandria and Egypt declared against him and refused to submit to him, and he made himself strong to war against them with a numerous force and army, and with his three colleagues in the empire, Maximian of a wicked stock, Constantius, and Maximian Galerius. And he went down into Egypt and made it subject to him, and as for the city of Alexandria, he destroyed it. Diocletian's repression of Christian Alexandria left such an impression on the oppressed community that in the 4th century they began to mark the year 284 as the beginning of the era of Diocletian. The Coptic Church truly experienced severe repression and oppression in the 3rd and early 4th centuries, but its rich history and influence on Alexandria involved major contributions to early Christian theology. After Diocletian's oppression of Egypt's Christians had ended, the Coptic Church was free to develop its theology and culture in peace. The Emperor Constantine, ruled 307 to 337, officially ended the persecution of Christians in the empire, and even returned privileges to the clergy that had been taken away by Diocletian. Late in the reign of Constantine, the Coptic Church played a role in the development of what would become the basis of modern Christianity when they sent bishops as representatives to confer with ones from Rome and Constantinople in the city of Nicaea in 325. Constantine had called the church representative to Nicaea, which was a city located in Anatolia, now Izmir, Turkey, in order to condemn the Christian sect known as Arianism, which held that Jesus was not divine. The three major churches of Christianity all agreed and drafted the Nicene Creed as a written avowal of their belief in Christ's divinity. For the Coptic Church, the Council of Nicaea proved to be a firm establishment of the Alexandrian Church's position in the Christian world and the reaffirmation of their theological beliefs. Although the Coptic Church's position in Alexandria, Egypt, and the world was established with the Council of Nicaea, Old religious habits and beliefs were slow to die in Egypt. A sizable pagan community remained in Alexandria after the Roman Empire was officially divided into halves in 395. Alexandria, which was in the eastern half, was ruled by the emperors in Constantinople, who would later become known as the Byzantine emperors. Religious life for the Copts in Alexandria during the 5th century was free of persecution, 
since the Eastern Roman emperors were Christians, but it was during this period that the leaders of the Coptic Church began to focus their attentions towards the followers of the ancient gods who lingered in Alexandria. While Theophilus, 385-412, to was the Pope of the Coptic Church, he actively pursued a program of persecution against the old gods. According to legend, Theophilus's anti-pagan attitude began as a child when his Nubian servant brought him to a pagan temple. John of Nicu wrote, And it is said in regard to the holy Theophilus, the patriarch of Alexandria, that he was a citizen of Memphis, the city of Pharaoh, formerly called Arcadia, and he was of Christian origin, and he had a little sister and an Ethiopian slave who had belonged to his parents. Now they were orphans, and he was but a child in years and stature, and one night about the time of dawn the slave took the children by the hand and brought them to a temple of abominable gods, namely of Artemis and Apollo, in order to pray there according to the errors of their worship. And when the children entered, the gods fell to the earth and were broken, and the slave was frightened thereby, and she took the children and went in flight to the city of Nicius for she feared the priest of the abominable idols, and she feared also lest the people of Nicias should deliver her up to the priests of the idols, and so she carried off the children with her, and came to Alexandria. Theophilus spent the remainder of his life in the service of the church, working his way up the hierarchy until he became the Pope in Alexandria. Once in a powerful position, the Pope wasted no time in his anti-pagan campaign. In the 390s, Theophilus's campaign focused on transforming the temple of Serapis in Alexandria into a Christian church, which led to intense fighting and riots between the Christians and pagan religious communities. According to John of Nicu, Theophilus had the temple of Serapis, known as Serapium, destroyed, and a church built on its ruins that housed the relic of St. John the Baptist's bones. And there were certain inhabitants of Alexandria who took the body of St. John and conveyed it to Alexandria, and gave it secretly to the holy Athanasius, the patriarch, before his flight. And he conveyed it and placed it secretly in the house of a magistrate, one of the greatest people of the city. And this secret was known only to a few priests and to Theophilius, the third patriarch after Athanasius. Now the latter was reader and singer when they brought the body of St. John. And after Athanasius, Peter became patriarch. And after Peter, his brother Timothy, Actamon, whose name is, by interpretation, without possessions. And after Timothy, Theophilus, who destroyed the temple named Serapis, and converted it into a church. Now this church was massive, and its dimensions lofty, and it was very much decorated. And he made it with pomp the abiding place of the body of St. John the Baptist. And it is also said that after many days Theophilus took the body of St. John and his head and placed them in the tomb which had been constructed in the midst of the church. And he made great rejoicings and a glorious feast. And the inhabitants of the city were uplifted because of him and made him notable with praise. Theophilus repeated these actions on other occasions which proved to be highly successful in advancing the Coptic church at the expense of the old gods. As the Alexandria church grew in subsequent decades, it eventually broke from its cousins in Rome and Constantinople. In 451, representatives from the churches in Alexandria, Rome, and Constantinople met once more, this time in the Greek city of Chalcedon, in an attempt to reach compromise on some important theological issues. In particular, the churches in Rome and Constantinople advocated the idea that Jesus was of two natures, both human and divine, simultaneously, while the Alexandrian church held that Jesus was of one nature that was both human and divine. The theological difference may seem like a split hair to most people today, but in the 5th century, theological differences were intricately intertwined, with influence over secular powers, and since Egypt was essentially a colony of the Byzantine Empire in 451, its rift with the churches of Rome and Constantinople at the Council of Chalcedon left it on the outside looking in. The Coptic Church did not relent on its theological ideas, which resulted in an attempt by the Byzantine Emperor to place a man in the highest office in Alexandria that was closer to his beliefs. As John of Nicu wrote, the move resulted in violence throughout the city. When the Emperor Leo heard of the disturbances which had taken place in Alexandria, 
formerly in the days of Marcion, and of the massacre that had been occasioned by the Council of Chalcedon, and of the restoration of the true faith in the one nature of Christ, and of the slaughter of Proterius, bishop of the Chalcedonians, because of it. For this bishop, who had formerly been the ecclesiastical procurator in Alexandria, was consecrated bishop by the Chalcedonians, when he signed the imperial rescript, but the orthodox population rose against him, and slew him, and burned his body. After the smoke had settled from the Council of Chalcedon, followers of the Coptic Church began to be referred to as monophysite, one naturist, although the term is today viewed as derogatory by modern Copts. Despite the differences with Constantinople, the Alexandrian Church was allowed to function according to its own beliefs, and, as a result, Alexandria became a center of learning once more. In the late ancient world, the Alexandrian Church built one of the most renowned theological academies, known as the Alexandrian Catechetical School, which attracted students and scholars throughout the Christian world. Neoplatonic philosophers continued to study and write in Alexandria, but by the 6th century they were increasingly marginalized and sometimes even persecuted by the growing power of the Coptic Church. Eventually, the fairly benign rule of the Christian Byzantines gave way to the Arab-Muslim conquest of Egypt in 642. According to John of Nicu, Benjamin, 626-665, who was the Pope of the Coptic Church during the Islamic invasion, blamed the situation on the immorality of the Byzantines. John wrote, And Abba Benjamin, the patriarch of the Egyptians, returned to the city of Alexandria in the thirteenth year after his flight from the Romans, and he went to the churches and inspected all of them. And every one said, This expulsion of the Romans and victory of the Moslem is due to the wickedness of the emperor Heraclius and his persecution of the Orthodox through the patriarch Cyrus. This was the cause of the ruin of the Romans and the subjugation of Egypt by the Moslem. When the conquering Muslim general Amr entered Alexandria in 642, he was impressed with a marble building that still stood from the Ptolemaic period and the intersecting streets. Despite the impression Alexandria made on Amr, after Islamic rule extended into Egypt, Alexandria was relegated to a backwater and the Coptic church suffered through new periods of oppression. That was Ancient Alexandria, The History and Legacy of Egypt's Most Famous City by Charles River Editors, narrated by Colin Fluxman. Copyright 2016 by Charles River Editors. Production Copyright 2016 by Charles River Editors.